Hey, my friends, so glad you're here. Love talking to my friends on the podcast. Tracy Harris. Well, I met Tracy uh, years ago. I think it was a, at a convention or something. I think I was like, I was that guy. I love what you do. I love your work. I was that guy. And uh, I saw you in Austin. We were doing the Atheist Day event out there on uh, the Capitol grounds. And uh, I just wanted, with all the shit that's going on in the world, a chance just to talk like friends. Tracy Harris, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing actually pretty fantastic. <laughs> so right. I hear you're doing okay, too. Kind of busy, busy. That a day at Atheist Day in Austin was bizarre. Wasn't it? I mean, we're out there on the Capitol grounds. This was around the time that they were proposing some increased or fortified gun legislation. And uh, yes. those guys were out there at the periphery, you know, and they got the camo on and they're holding the AR-15 and the big flag that says, don't tread on me. And I looked at those guys and I looked at you and I thought, Texas, right? I mean, this is Texas. What was your take on the day? Well, as I recall, one of those guys came into the speaker area, which was sort of covered, and the uh, the folks that were hosting it were trying to usher him out, and I said, well, hold on a minute, I want to talk to this person. Um, so, I did sit and chat with him, and he was wearing a camera on his, you know, camo ball cap, <laughs> and, and I, he was taping it for something. I don't know what. I probably should have asked him, where is this going to go up, or are you live streaming, or, you know, what are, what is it? Because um, he was recording it for something, um, but we had a really good conversation. He was camoed out and had a big flag. I don't remember what he was flying it for, but he had his guns on, and um, he wanted to have a conversation. He had heard my talk, which was about um, alliances and forming, you know, allies. And he said, I think that we could have an ally situation here because I want evidence-based, you know, gun lo lo legislation. And I said, well, that's right up my alley. <laughs> so, let's have a talk. Um, and so, I talked to him about some stats. Um, and I do want to mention, there's a super, super fantastic course on gun statistics and um, education and the state of legislation at Coursera. And it's free, so I don't mind recommending it to people. I'm not selling anything here. Um, but it's by Johns Hopkins. And when the CDC was sort of guided away from doing research on gun control and gun legislation and gun policy, Johns Hopkins took up the gauntlet just on their own, said, we think it's the socially responsible thing to do. And they have been hosting forums with uh, global speakers and gathering information from all over the planet to put it together and look at policy statements for the U.S. and their recommendations based on evidence for what should happen with gun legislation if the goal is to reduce uh, gun violence deaths significantly. And a lot of folks whose hearts are in the right place who want, and on, I know both sides is way overused, but like this guy who came to talk to me, he clearly has, you know, a, a stake in this. And he wants evidence-based, you know, legislation. I want evidence-based legislation. So, let's sit down and talk about what that means. And he's, he's getting most of his information from the FBI site. And I was like, well, that's a good site for statistics. It's a fine site for statistics. But we're talking here about converting those statistics into policy, which is another question that you're not going to find at the FBI site. So, something like Johns Hopkins is a really good source um, at the Coursera on, you know, gun violence in America. Take that course, educate yourself on what are and are not the relevant concerns around gun violence. And when you have a conversation with someone, you will just be a little more informed. Um, and I was surprised, actually, at some of the statistics. So, some of the things that are big areas of conversation in the gun control dialogue are actually not big concerns when it comes to statistically contributing to gun violence, such as mental illness. So, you have all this conversation around mental illness and, and guns, and yet, the percentage of uh, gun violence that would be reduced if we were to get really, really proactive with making sure people that are mentally diagnosed mental illness um, don't have access to guns, it would bring it down about 4%. So, it's like a very minor uh, segment of gun violence that would be impacted by focusing on diagnosed mental illness and gun ownership. 
So it, it's more about looking at things that will really make an impact. Look at the large things, the things that are really impacting it at, at huge percentages, like history of violence, right? So if you have a history of um, violence, if you've been arrested for violent behavior, especially domestic violence, you probably have are going forward at a higher likelihood to commit violence with illegal violence with a gun, um, especially against a partner. So there's a lot of things that have a big impact um, and we'll be told sometimes, oh, well, those that's already illegal, right? Like if you have a if you're arrested, if you have you know domestic violence in your history, you can't do this, but it's not comprehensive. So for example, if you have violence against a partner, but you're not living with that partner, it does it's it's not the same. It's not handled the same way. And there's a lot of violence that goes on in these relationships that that aren't necessarily people living together. So we have to take another look at some of the things that we might think have already been covered that aren't really covered. As, as much as they need to be or in the right way where the problem is still persisting that we could maybe shore it up and make it better um, as opposed to things where people really freak out. They see like a, they hear something about someone had depression and they shot up a school and so we need to go after everybody with depression. But, you know, it, it's possible that the person's mental issues really weren't even tied to why they committed the act. Um, and if it was, it may be that this is some weird aberration, but they're just those stats are not that big a deal, but but the chunk of conversation that happens about that statistic um, is huge comparatively. You understand what I'm saying? Makes sense. Subject change. <laughs> okay. You have been involved with the Truth and Transparency Foundation. I've had the guys from the Truth and Transparency Foundation on the show talking about the Jehovah's Witnesses. They got a lawsuit against them right now. Yes, You and I have been do. talking about this. I want to address this. What the hell is going on with the Jehovah's Witnesses and Truth and Transparency? Um, it's really interesting. So, Truth and Transparency, you, you say you had them on and people can go and look that up, but they've published, they publish um, basically the idea for folks who may not know, 501c3s, uh, foundations that are tax deductible, generally you have reporting requirements and the assumption is that you're doing public good. So you put in your application, you explain to the government what it is that you're doing and why you are going to help the public and how you're going to help the public and you get a tax deductible status and then you're required to do a certain amount of reporting. But with religious institutions, they get this tax-free status, um, tax deductible status, uh, without demonstrating really public good. There's like an assumption that because they are a religious institution, they are automatically performing public good, which I think a lot of folks understand is not always the case. And on top of that, for some reason, they have less reporting requirements. So they are not required to do a lot of things that the rest of these groups are required to do in order to have that tax, um, tax deductible status, tax exempt status. And as a result, Truth and Transparency Foundation has basically said, we will be the reporting. We will handle that part that is not transparent and you send us the documentations and if we get them and we can vet them, we will publish them. And so what they are is just sort of a website that says, here was sex abuse that wasn't reported, here is financial um, information that wasn't reported and not necessarily, you know, it doesn't even necessarily have to be uh, anything nefarious, like they reported on the Mormon church holdings that these they had this outrageous amount of money, and then later it turned out to be even more, and it was just wild amounts of money just in the stock market, not even their total holdings. And it was just about saying, people need to know this. Their church needs to know this. Do you know how much money your church is really sitting on and how much ass assets that, that they have? So sometimes it's just plain because you're not reporting it, we're going to report it. And sometimes it is actually like abuse or corruption or something going on that they are exposing. But some of their targets, um, they started out as Mormon leaks, and that's why their, their targets were mainly Mormons. And then they started to get more information on Jehovah Witnesses. And so they started publishing um, situations that were happening within the JW Church. And in this particular instance, they have published these videos in order to show what the culture is like there. So the videos themselves were just kind of thrown up saying, this is the culture. Now what those videos entail are little video kind of, they're like little video courses. And um, I think there is a, there's a, there's a GoFundMe site and I think you're going to be posting that link and I don't yeah, want to put it in the, the description spot. box. Okay. You bet. Okay. 
The GoFundMe site has an article with it that explains a little bit about what's going on and has some links. Well, the, there's a link to the videos. and I encourage people to kind of check it out because those videos may not remain up. That's what the lawsuit is about. So right now those videos are up and they have been up for a while. We, uh, The Truth and Transparency Foundation was asked to remove them. They responded with like a legal letter and never heard back. So now, a long time later, they're being, um, this is being pursued again with the church basically saying you didn't respond and, or you did respond, but you, you didn't take them down. And so now we're going to sue you to take them down. The weird thing is they're only suing to take down some of them, not all of them. And what's really interesting is the ones they want taken down are the ones that are not all that, they're not as bad as some of the others, right? So there's one, for example, called the attack of Gog, of Magog. And the whole point to that video is do whatever the church tells you to do and questioning is evil. And when you see it, you're, you're kind of like, whoa, this is, this, is, this is their training materials. The Jehovah Witnesses produce these videos. They show them at their conventions. And the conventions happen annually. They put out these videos annually. And what they, what's interesting is that the conventions are free and open to the public. Now, they're not going to be attended by many folks who aren't JWs or interested in joining the church. But the fact is, they're free and open to the public. So, these videos are not like a cash cow for the church. It's not like posting them is robbing them of any income or infringing on you know, in some way that's causing damages. I mean, these are their materials that they are putting out. We are crediting them with producing these on the site where we are sharing them. Um, We're not costing them anything to do it. We're not, you know, it's, it's almost like free publicity for your videos. But the problem is that because we have published other things that when you see these videos in conjunction with the reporting on the abuses, you start to realize that it is a culture that the church actually fosters. Do you remember the movie, um, what was it, where the guy did the, the little self thing where he went to McDonald's and he gained a bunch of weight eating nothing but McDonald's? Yeah, supersize me. Yeah, Morgan's and his whole life. thing was, part of what he was trying to talk about with the lawsuit was McDonald's actually promotes that people should eat this stuff all the time, right? So it wasn't just about they're serving food and everyone knows it's not that healthy. It was about they're promoting that people should be consuming way more of this than they should to, to be healthy. And that's not a good thing. And so part of what McDonald's was doing was trying to argue that their food was not intended for, you know, con- constant consumption while in the meantime, promoting messages saying that this should be constantly consumed. So this is kind of what we're dealing with, with the JW church is they're basically creating this culture and putting it out in these videos. And then when something comes up like a sex abuse case and it doesn't get reported and people are like, wow, how could this go on and go unreported and nobody said anything. And then you see these videos that show what they're actually promoting as far as don't go outside the church and don't question. And if we tell you we're handling something, it might not make sense to you, but you don't need to worry about it. Just do what we tell you. And so when you start to see that culture in conjunction with the documents, it becomes a little more insidious. So, they're going after these innocuous videos, like these ones that are not that big a deal. What TTF did was they just published all of them. And so what the church is trying to do is get these takedowns for the ones that would be easiest to take down to say, well, this doesn't show something about the culture or that doesn't show something about the culture, but they're trying to kind of inch away and chip away at the freedom to publish these things and the freedom to expose these things by trying to find where is the weak link in the chain that we can start attacking from. And so they, we have two options. Number one was we can just do what they say and take videos down and just start taking stuff down as they threaten to sue us. And that would be sort of the less expensive legal option. But I spoke with, you know, um, Ethan and he was, he didn't say it, but it was pretty clear to me in the conversation that he wanted to fight this and that he believes that um, after speaking to counsel, that we would have a case. The problem is fighting it is obviously going to be the more expensive option. And that's where we're running into trouble. And that's what the GoFundMe is for. Um, because we can, we can just, you know, bow to the church here and take the stuff down and start taking down anything whenever they threaten us. Or we can say no, and we can stand up for ourselves in this. And by doing so also set 
potentially precedent later if they challenge us and we do end up in court um, to help other outlets with the same situation have an easier time of defending themselves. That was going to be one of my questions about precedent, right? I mean, this is kind of a shoot your cuffs lawsuit, right? All right, fine. We're going to show anybody and everybody who tries to show what happens behind closed doors in our cult. We're going to show them. We're going to intimidate them. I mean, this is speculation, but you know, right. this is what it feels like to me, right? We're going to send a message to anybody and everybody who tries to call us out for what we are actually doing, and we're going to shut them down or threaten to shut them down, right? Right, and they're claiming that what we're posting is not newsworthy because it's not you know, directly relatable to these articles, but I understand why TTF wants to fight it, and I understand... Um, that they you don't want to go to you don't want to go to a gunfight with a knife, right? And the Jehovah Witnesses are not a poor institution that's going to have trouble um, hiring representation, and so the representation that we've talked to is representation that could feasibly go head to head with them and offer a really good argument that could potentially win this thing. If we didn't believe that, we wouldn't be asking for help. Um, it's ridiculously expensive though and so the gofundme i think the the price that they told us is um i think 20 20 to thirty thousand. if we and and this is something i'd have to check with ryan but it was like 20 or thirty thousand just for us to sort of come back to them and say go for it and then to fight it further um they've estimated that the total costs you know in in a reasonable estimate would be about forty thousand dollars and that would include that initial sort of yeah, we're not going to comply, um, and then going to court. Well, it's also so, kind of the undiscovered country. I mean, who knows what yeah, they're going to pull get worse. out, what they're going to do. Yeah, it I could mean, get it's worse. The fog but, of I mean, war. I, understand, yeah. I understand why the guys want to fight it, and I understand, I mean, for me, if I were to pressure them or if other people I think that were advising them were to pressure them and say, just fold, I think that we might be able to talk them into just folding, but I don't think they would ever, ever feel like that was the right thing they did. And I, I know what that feels like. And I want them to feel like they at least tried to pursue the thing they wanted. And honestly, even if the GoFundMe doesn't hit the numbers that they need, because we're going to need, we need by next week, we're probably going to have to come up with an answer because July 7th is our filing deadline to respond. So we need to have a plan by then, which means that next week is sort of it for us. If we don't get, you know, close to the figure we're trying to get to, um, we may not have any choice but to fold. But at the same time, at least I know that I encourage them to do what they thought was right and that they tried their best to do what was right. And that's, at least they can sleep at night. That, to me, is worth a lot. Donate. The link's in the description (laughs) box. Do something. By the way, (laughs) are you driven as crazy as I am by the double standard with the 501c3s? I mean, you know, the parsonage exemptions and the fact that they don't have to be as transparent. It's a total double double standard. And if you... It makes no sense. It makes no sense. This is the thing that truth and transparency, they actually have, you know, people sometimes look at them as like, oh, so you're like an atheist group. Or you, and they're like, no, actually, our, we have supporters that are believers who just believed that they want their churches to be more transparent. This is, you know, something that helps everybody. If you're part of an organization, wouldn't you rather that organization be transparent? Yeah, I mean, if you're not hiding anything, I mean... 501c3s have to re- report all the time our financials and here's our expenses and here's the appropriations and here's our right. system of accountability. What's the big deal? And uh, it, I, it just makes me a little bit crazy. When you see, for example, these huge mega churches right now, like demanding to reopen, and please don't get me wrong, because I know that there are responsible churches who are happy to keep live streaming their sermons and keep people social distance and they're doing the right thing. But you see some of these people that are just really in it for, I want those, you know, I, I want those people to be able to come and meet. And they are doing everything they can to do something that is known to be harmful. And I just posted a, a video that was, um, I think it was American Atheists, I've, I've got it on my Facebook page, but it was, uh, you know, kind of a slew of atheists basically talking about what they're doing to social distance and how they're wearing their masks and they care about other people. And I look at that and it, and I just think to myself, why is it not obvious to, you know, everybody involved that is the whole nation that generates the push for legislation and puts our representatives in the office, 
why is it that it's that this myth persists that association with God makes you instantly moral? See, this is why I've missed hearing your voice, Tracy. <laughs> like that's a T-shirt, right? I, that's something I could wear around just as a. <laughs> it's a long story. T-shirt. <laughs> that's a big fine big print t-shirt. T-shirt, but it's still. A, you're one of those people like you. And we'll get into what you're up to these days. I'm going to talk about the the podcasting and the and the writing. But your Facebook posts are actually more interesting to me and often more fodder for conversation than like official articles that are sent to me. I'm just like, oh, Tracy said that. And I'm, I have two thoughts. First, that's really interesting. And shit, why didn't I think of that? Because it's an <laughs> angle I hadn't yet considered. So I knew if I had you on the show, we'd have some good conversations. Before I move on to my next subject, let's talk to our listeners. Area code 716. Hi, you're on The Thinking Atheist with Tracy Harris. Who's this? Hi, Seth. I'm Brandon. How are you guys doing? Doing well. Hey. Brandon, you got a comment or question Excellent. for the show? Talk to me. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in a lot of bits of this conversation, but I'm starting to wonder if we're only talking about symptoms. Because what I notice is not just in religious culture, but in white American culture, we have this brutality towards each other. And we don't listen to each other. And that's what I love about this program. You listen. Um, and it seems to me that with gun violence and, and a lot of this religious idealism that we're seeing right now, um, we're kind of getting at the same issue is religious groups don't listen to out groups. And in our families, we are not listened to. And in our schools and in all our institutions, when we try to bring up different concerns, we don't listen to each other and we brutalize each other. And then you take on top of that mental illness and now it's suddenly like, okay, I can start to see why there's all these white kids shooting up schools. Because at some point when you're not being listened to and when you're being brutalized by the very people in your own life and you're screaming out, hey, 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 listen, listen, I'm a person, I have these feelings, I have these thoughts. I'm not sure it's the the Christian institutions that are shutting it down. I'm starting to wonder if it's something that's culturally institutionalized all around. And I would like some thoughts on that because it seems like a very intense thought process. (laughs) Okay, well, there's a lot to unpack here. So because I'm not as fast as Tracy, I want to make sure that I know what you're talking about. Are you talking about... The fact that we are factions, we are tribal, we have in-group, out-group thinking that causes us to shut down our ears. We're not interested in understanding. Those who do not feel listened to then become desperate and do desperate things. Is that a correct encapsulation? Yes. Yes, only I'm saying it. We do it in our families and friend groups. It's not just institutional. I see it on 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 a familiar level. And that's, and that's why I'm starting to wonder if our, our questions about these institutions are, are, are talking about symptoms. Tracy Harris, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this kind of goes back. I, I think that you're correct to associate sort of the micro level of communication with the macro level of communication. I, I do that as well. So um, when I first went to college, I was very much into communications. And that was my original degree was communication studies. And so when you look at um, how people psychologically deal with conflict um, or an unmet unmet need. Uh, So for example, you want something and you feel like you need this thing and you come to me and you ask me for it or you're trying to express that you need this thing and I give you some response that doesn't quite get you what you need. So you try again and you restate your your concern and you say, hey, here's what I need. And then I don't get you what you need. Now, the static between you trying to communicate that and me understanding it can come in many forms. It could literally be um, there's loud construction going on outside that keeps me from actually hearing you. Or it could be that I'm very defensive about this thing. And so I can't listen to you because I've got my own issues with it. Or it could be that you're not communicating it well. There's all kinds of things that could be in play here that make that message not be heard. But the reality is the longer you go without the thing you need 
And the longer you keep trying to get that help to get it and you, you refuse that help or you're not getting that help or you're not getting adequate help, the more frustrated you become. So you start to get building frustration. And in a conversation, that might turn into like raising your voice or it might turn into posturing where you just start getting in someone's face or it could ultimately escalate to striking a person or starting a real physical altercation there. The same thing happens at a social level, right? It's not any different. If somebody keeps Mm -hmm. trying and trying and trying to communicate a thing to you and you do not get them what they need, um, and they keep being murdered in the streets, uh, then your town gets set on fire. And that is a predictable outcome when you understand what happens with people psychologically when this when they're blocked constantly from um, being heard. So I hear what you're saying, and I can tell you that from a psychological model standpoint in communication, it is completely accurate. Now, as to how you fix it, that's another story that's that becomes a, an issue of trying to help people learn to communicate better right right that makes sense and i i guess that's what i'm trying to get to is in in our particular culture how do you do that um yeah. and that's the conversation you're having <laughs> and we have a we have a really vi- i mean there's no doubt that we have a very violent culture right i mean the united states has high levels of violence compared to a lot of other um nations that are as affluent or, you know, in that same category. And I, when you, it's funny because when you talked about, I I don't know that it's, um, you know, a racially, well, I I shouldn't say that there, there are some areas in which it is racially specific, Uh, especially um, what's interesting is that social metrics for uh, white people, we tend to do well. So from a social metric standpoint in societies uh, like in the U S but where we don't do well, which is at first surprising, is suicide rates. So white people have high levels of right. suicide rates. But if you think about it and you start looking into it, right, when you start to get more information, white men are more likely to try to commit suicide the first time with a gun. And guns are the best, most successful method of committing suicide. I mean, and that's such a weird way to phrase it. But basically, if, you, if your goal is to kill yourself, a gun is probably your best bet. Um, and I do not recommend right. <laughs> anyone do it. I'm just saying that we have kind of a gun culture. And for some reason, white men will turn to a gun before another method. Um, people who try to kill themselves with pills or, you know, cutting or some other, you know, hanging other methods are not as successful. And if you aren't as successful in your first suicide attempt, you are less likely to die by suicide. So, in other words, it seems Mm -hmm. like, I mean, I'm not going to say that it's a fact, but it seems like if you don't kill yourself the first time, maybe you don't try so much again. Um, Whereas, and so that first time, doing it right the first time makes you the the statistic. It it makes you more likely to be the statistic. And we are more, uh, we have more of a tendency in white America to think of a gun. um, And that drives up our rates. Mm -hmm. White men have the highest rates of suicide. Right. It's almost like in white America, we jump to extremes quicker. And, and, and part of that, I'm wondering know. if it really is interpersonal communication where we're, we're shut down and emotionally isolated for so long. When I look at statistics, like half of Americans say they have no friends. Wait, no wait, one wait, 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 hold to. on, hang I on, talk, hold on. Half of Americans say they have no friends? Yes, yeah, say they have no close friends or no friends at all. I'd have to, like, I'd um, have to the see the metrics on that. That seems to me an extreme statistic. I, I'm not saying that I, I disbelieve that's you. Why I'm con- that's why I'm concerned. Okay, <laughs> I, I, would, I would like, you know, I'd like you to, to throw a, a, you know, some back, uh, background on that. But I, I, well, I, I do see a stat, just ripping it up real quick here. Um, the New York Post has got a little stat in 2019 that says one in five millennials are lonely and have no friends. Is it possible that that's... Yeah, I've seen that as well. And that that is almost universally recognizable within our generation. Is we talk about that kind of openly. Can uh, and, and that's also interesting. Can Tracy and I chew on this for just a little bit and uh, and <laughs> No, please, I'd like to hear you guys chew on it. That's why I'm I was throwing something out there and I'd really like to hear your discussion. It's a great call. I appreciate your time and and thanks for being a part of the broadcast, my friend. Yeah, thank you, Seth. You bet. You've been a help to a lot of people. Oh, you're very kind. All thank right. you. Goodbye. Thank you. All right. 
this is a human problem though, right? I mean, is it, a, it's, I mean, when he says. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is, we, we all, I think in the United States, we're not the, the best communicating society. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, when he says, "Well, this is a problem with white America," I mean, I I get it. You know, we're- I mean, he if that I'm gonna say, you know, let's, let's be generous and say that um, he's speaking for his own situation because he did say like he was mainly concerned about his familial and close circle situation, right? So he might just be saying that among my friends, this seems to be the thing. Um, why that would travel to white, I'm not quite sure. We could have explored that more, um, but. I'm going to just say that um, I agree. Overall, we could do a better job of communicating. I do think that when you are in the, there's two separate things, right? You can be an oppressor class that's a minority, or you can be an oppressor class that's a majority, and that's where kind of we are now. And when you have both those things going on with you, where you are both the majority and the, the main power holder, I think it's more important for you in that position and me in that position to be able to listen. Like we have to be able to hear because we are like one of the things he was describing, we are so insulated, right? I mean, we are very, it's very uncommon. It's much more common to have like um, as a white person, a huge circle of white friends because there's so many white people and where you're, where you're living is going to generally be like white. Um, And so I'm not saying that that is like a, a hard and fast rule. Like I say, it's a generalization, but when I'm surrounded by people who are pretty much like myself, which our peers are usually who our friends are, um, it means that it's, that I uh, become distanced from the experiences and the lives of people who are different. You understand what I'm saying? That makes sense. Let's talk about, uh, I mean, we're talking about the culture that we live in in the wake of George Floyd, et cetera. All right. Let's be a couple of white people talking about racism. That'll be interesting. Oh, fun. As, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm just going to throw a piece. Of, well, this is just red meat, I'm sure, for the comment section. And I don't mean for it to be that way. But I mean, I want to be able to talk candidly about these very sensitive issues in good faith without people losing their minds. So I'd like this to be an example of how that goes. Are you and I, as people who have enjoyed white privilege for our lives in the United States, is racism baked into us from your perspective? Are we whether we know it, whether yeah, we can help it, are I, we racist? I think I actually, you were saying you sometimes see my post. I actually just posted that it's baked in. That for me, when people um, look at it and they say, I don't see the racism, it, I was saying that it, it reminds me of someone asking me how many eggs are in a cake I made. And I say, well, there was three eggs in this cake. And so they slice it open and they say, I don't see any eggs. Right? That's because the eggs are baked in. It, it just looks like it's cake, right? And so with, with us... Um, when you so there's here's a good way to explain it right so the company that i work for and i'm not making comparisons again to demographics it's just that this is a similar situation that we have at my work we make a product that traditionally serves very well certain segments of the population and not so well other segments of the population from a corporate standpoint the segments of the population that we don't serve as well sadly, does not tend to matter because they tend to be segments of the population that are forgotten most of the time and don't have a lot of the money. So we have come to realize that we are not doing a very good job for disabled people and or people who are disabled. See, that's something I need to work on too, person first, people with a disability. Um, So... When we're looking at our product, if we want to, our product is intended to help people to succeed, right? And so we have got a mission now that is we will make every user succeed. That's our goal. When we look at what's going on with people that we're not serving, who are not doing as well, who are having problems using our product because they are blind, they are deaf, they have, you know, other issues that, that um, you know, physical disabilities that may cause them to have to use certain um, tools that make the product work for them in a different way. Instead of us just tacking on, um, saying like, here's our product for all the able people, and here's our little extensions for the disabled people that we just threw together because we're legally required. We're losing that attitude. 
and the attitude we're taking is this product needs to be built with it needs to be baked in that every student succeeds. We need to make a product that every student will succeed. So, for example, when you look at cars, right, cars, we have cars, and then if you're disabled, you can have a car that works a little differently. But when you start thinking about the future of self-driving cars, that's a car that provides a huge amount of accessibility, even to people that formerly couldn't drive. You can literally be blind and get into a self-driving car and get where you're going now, driving, quote, yourself. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, that makes sense. It's a product that is built to be accessible to far more people because instead of looking at them as these sorts of um, extra people that don't matter and don't count, you're making a product that you're going to say everybody has to count and we're going to do everything we can to make sure that we're being inclusive and accessible to as much as we can do, whatever we can figure out. And so we're going to make sure that you're going to succeed as a driver if you're blind. You're going to succeed as a driver if you have no arms. You're going to succeed as a driver if you have arms and can see. We want every driver to succeed. We want to make a car that lets everybody get to where they're going and do what they need to do. Um, and so when you have that attitude and you look at, for example, so if you and I are working on a product and we have a product and we're looking at the statistics and we find that 90% of our users or abled people have a great rating of our product, but only 20% of the disabled population says they use our product and like our product. Would you say we have a problem there that's related to ability? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, obviously. I mean, if it, obviously, right? Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. So when you look at a society, what is society? Society is a product, right? It's basically a group that says, if you become a member with us, here's what you get. Here's the benefits of joining us and being a part of our society. And here's, we will protect you against foreign invasion. We will try to make sure that you're economically successful. To me, the purpose of the society should be just like the product. We are here to ensure the success of every citizen. We are here to make sure that every individual succeeds because the individuals as a collective make up the society. When they succeed, we succeed. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes total sense. Okay. So you have a product, you're putting it out there, and you start looking at your demographics and your feedback. And what you find is that you have certain groups that are consistently not successful using your product. We have a problem. Right. So if I find that when it comes to education, to health care, to um, mental health uh, metrics, to um, economic earning, to heritable wealth retention, to um, justice system A to Z, and there are demographics that are constantly not doing as well. Right? And we see, for example, people that are economically disadvantaged are probably going to be doing pretty bad a across the board, would you say? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, yeah. If we look up these stats, we're going to see yeah, that yeah. the wealthier you are, the healthier you're going to be, the more educated you're going to have access to, well, the I, better I mean, health If I can jump in quickly, get. though, this is where the Fox News conservative says, this America, I mean, just pull the, the uh, success story. Uh, sort of backdrop of this country is filled with people who overcame, who quote unquote pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. And okay, came but we from can nothing. say that about the blind people. Can we say that then about the blind? There's 20 percent of blind people here that said our product is rated well. What if, so? Who cares about the 80 percent that that are having trouble with it and yeah. think it sucks? I mean, I agree would, with you. Would I'm just we playing do that, Devil's right? advocate here because you know, right? But what I'm saying is they're basically saying screw the people who who have trouble using our product. And I'm saying that if you are man if you are manufacturing a product and you really think that that and, and when somebody's having trouble using it, your response is so what? This is the product. Well, it also demonstrates an alarming lack of empathy in my mind, which was kind of my mindset back. And I mean, I was a more tribal, very much. Uh, I was sort of xenophobic, even with ideas. Right? I mean, it was bizarre. Uh, this insular right. culture. So. But, but what I guess what I'm saying, though, is you have to admit that your product is not suited to people who are blind when 80% of them are having trouble with it. Okay. And you can see a statistical, you know, uh, issue here that is significant um, where one group's okay with it and one group's having trouble with it. So your product is not conducive to blind people being successful with it. All right. That's so let's fact. draw a parallel between what you're talking about now and United States law enforcement. 
right? The police with the defund the police hashtag. Not a fan of the hashtag, Tracy. We can talk about that. But I am a fan of completely rethinking how we see law enforcement in this country. Would that be an example from your perspective of us going back and sort of, uh, I don't know, recreating the product from scratch? What would you do? Yeah, I definitely think that what we at least at least what we need to do is come to an understanding that when we look at the statistics across the board and we can look at every health, social health metric almost, you know, like I said, suicide, white people, not so good. When we look at the social health metrics and we see that consistently and by a large margin, our black communities are not performing as well, right? We need to say the product does not work as well for black citizens as it does for white citizens. It simply is statistically demonstrated to not, we are not as successful in allowing them to succeed, right, in our society as we are allowing others to succeed in our society. Some people in our society by a, that can be statistically identified are not being supported in their success when it comes to making good in our society based on social metrics. That's just a fact. And the police situation is just one more metric, right? And I, I actually had a conversation with someone who was like, well, but you know, there's violent crime. And, 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 and when you look at the numbers of violent crime, this is actually expected. And, and I was like, you have, you have to ask yourself, why do you have a demographic involved in more violent crime? Is it that they're actually more violent? Or is it that they get escalated to violence, right? Didn't we just see in Atlanta, a man sleeping off a bender in his car end up dead like could could somebody have not called his family could somebody have not have just tried to identify him can we see your id can we maybe get in touch with somebody in his you know next of kin you know wife does he have a wife does he have a, somebody that we can contact that could come down here and help us kind of clean this up or or do we end up you know just trying to pin him down trying to get a handcuffs on him losing our taser to a drunken man while we're two of us on one of him and then shooting him as he runs away i mean was that the right answer? And when you when you see that categorized as now we have a video of it, but if we didn't, he'd probably go down as somebody who was killed resisting arrest violently, right? I mean, wouldn't that probably be the report? Absolutely. Yeah. So he's killed in a violent crime. Really, he was killed for sleeping off a bender. I, I mean, that's to me a pro. The problem is that this escalated, you know, and so and it when, escalates more often than not leaning in a specific or against a specific demographic of the American public. Yeah, I mean, that is, I think that's where people kind of give me pushback. But my answer is, however you want to slice and dice it, we can look at the stats and they are statistically, it's not random, right? I mean, it, there is too many more instances when you look at the black community and you look at education stats and you look at housing stats and you look at financial stats and you look at when you just go down the line, healthcare stats, mental health stats, just go down the line. And what you're going to see is that they are having difficulty using our product. We have a product that does not make it easy for them to succeed. No, we agree. I mean, I, was, I think yeah. I was trying to, yeah. to say and what to you me, were what saying. I'm you saying just said is, it better. So. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so what we're doing here is, when and when that is broken down into um, finances, when you look at it from a poverty versus you know entitlement standpoint, then what you're saying is that, hey, we have a problem here with users that are less uh, economically advantaged. Right or they are an economically disadvantaged. They have a problem succeeding in our society. Our society is not set up to help them succeed. And when you look at it and you slice and dice it racially, you see that they're oh wow, there's actually racial stats here. And like I said, if we were doing a product, we'd want to know, and we would say there is a racist component to how our product is not working, you know, equally for all our users. And that's what's happening with our society. And we need to look at where it's not working. And instead of getting upset about, you know, like whatever it is people are freaking out about, we just need to say, look, the product doesn't work for these people. We've got a product that works great for some of us and works really crappy for others. And we have to quit treating them like they don't matter and that if it doesn't work for them, so what? The uh, saying I like to throw out is, uh, why would I upset the apple cart if I'm enjoying all the apples? Right. There you go. If you're going hungry, I mean, uh, sorry, sucks for you. I mean, I'll do what I can, but you're yeah. still an afterthought. And yeah, our society needs to be something, needs to be more focused, in my opinion, on the idea of looking at those demographics that we know are struggling in this culture and saying, 
why does the culture work for some people and not for others? And what can we do to make it work for the people it's not working for? Well, and fix the world for me, Tracy. What do you do? Well, we're we're the ones running this show, right? So me and you, we're the people that own most of the Congress, right? You look at most of the Congress, they look like you and me. Well, actually, they look more like you than they do me, <laughs> except a little older it's than you. True. But you know what I'm saying? When, you, when you're on top of the power structure, you better figure it out. And so what I'm looking at is when you have the power, the problem that we've had in the past, from what I can gather, is the people that were making the decisions, I think we need to, to have a broader conversation with more stakeholders, right? So we have to have more of the people that are in the communities that are impacted by the decisions at the table discussing the decisions. So again, if I look at it from a product standpoint, you don't just want to sit with a bunch of able-bodied people in a room making decisions about how to make the product better for someone who's blind, right? You want to have blind people in there telling you about what's the problem with your product and how come they have trouble using it, right? You want their feedback, their stakeholders. They're the people you need to be talking to about how to improve the product, right? Well, you have to remove selfishness from the equation or profiteering or the opportunistic or the sociopathic. I mean, holy shit, you know, you're going to need a whole lot of good faith in that room to make it happen. But I mean, I'm on your page. I genuinely, yeah. I'm one of those guys. Like, I'd like to see, like, if you succeed, they succeed. We all succeed. Cooperative societies, they're better for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And if some, if you have a segment of the society that is struggling in that society, then you have to acknowledge that your society is not doing a very good job of serving that demographic, period. I, I I promise I'm going to talk about your podcast. Are you okay for time? Can I take a couple of calls? And I'll, no, I'm, right. I'm fine. Right. Yeah. Uh, I've got 603. Been on hold a while. Thanks for your patience. You're on with Tracy Harris. Who's this? Amanda. Hi, Amanda. Thanks for waiting hey. on me. What do you have for us? Comment or question? Well, I'm just kind of curious. Um, perhaps we actually need to rethink about the whole so social construct of society. In what way? <clears throat> um, well, you know, you got religion. You know, our big complaints is non-believers and stuff. It's, you know, it's all into that. Perhaps we actually need to stop looking at the, like, fine details and actually look at the, the big things. What is good for society and maybe have a big vote on what we can all agree on as a society, you know, things that we should agree on. Um, you get pulled over by the police. You're not going to get a tased or whatever. And, it, you know, I, I find it funny that you're uh, in not for nothing, I, you know, I really respect the, 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 the host you have on. I really loved all her stuff, but, you know, it, it's, everything is complex. And now we've got, like, computers doing AI and all that kind of stuff, and, like, when it comes to facial recognition, they can't even tell the difference between two people of color and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Well, and yet Facebook but, recognizes me like in a heartbeat if somebody posts a photo. Yeah. Right. Probably. So, in which uh, I'm not even going to. All right. So that. let me just stop you but, because we're, I, I feel that we're spinning a, a little bit off your main point. But if we live in the divided states of America, I mean, we can't agree on anything, right? We have people. We have people who are philosophically, diametrically opposed about many of the basic, what I think Tracy and I and you would consider human rights issues. There's a huge swath of people who they fundamentally disagree on that. How would you bring us all together to have that conversation where we all are in lockstep? Um, can I interject just one thing yeah. before we get, get to that? Um, healthcare. And DACA. When in 2016, when we got a new administration that took office, those were two issues where America was very greatly united. Right? Healthcare 
we, 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 we were united on health care. Everybody wanted it. Yeah. Yeah, everybody wanted, felt like we need to. We either need to change it so more people get it, or we have. But it had to. You know, there was this idea that we that we need better health health access. Okay, hang on. And forgive the interruption. I want to make sure I'm clear. They weren't necessarily agreeing on the methodology, but the philosophy that we need health care for our citizens, right? Because they argue right. about people, single payer or privatization, uh, et cetera, right? I guess, yeah. But when you talk about they argue, it's it's important to look at the, the numbers. Like, who is they, right? Is they the representatives or is they the people? And what I'm saying is when you look at, at people wanting coverage, people want to be covered. They want access to health care. And... There's this, there is this narrative that has become more divisive of, oh, you're not going to take away my private insurance. That has been drummed up in the last few years, right, as a result of, I mean, we had the, the, um, the ACA was a really rough push, right? So we, that's a long eight-year story of battle. Um, but at the point, everybody wanted to see health care revised. Let's... Let's just go then with DACA, if, if healthcare is, is going to be confusing. DACA had high, high uh, rates of, of the U.S. being in support of giving these people status for citizenship, right? We had like 80% national support for that. There was no co- conflict. And we still don't have it, but not for lack of unity, You see what I'm well, saying? Maybe it's actually our election system. Well, I think that's what I'm saying is when I, I think that some of the some of the dissent that we're talking about is like a small amount of dissent. But we don't have we have more numbers of people that are disenfranchised in this country so that you don't really get I think we're more unified than we think, but we don't get a chance to um, express that because we have so many issues that have to do with who votes. Is that right? uh, so in part gerrymandering D- and voter ID laws? Mm-hmm. And I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I forgive yeah, the interruption. Yeah. I'm sorry. I hear a pause and I jump in. Is some of yeah. that because of the gatekeepers? I mean, we have people in key positions who are able to sort of lock out the rest of us to a degree. Is there? Some oh, absolutely! Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. You have you have. If we had more people voting, if we if we had everybody voting, um, you'd see, I think, a whole different look to our government. Yeah, we've got fights about like uh, people that can't vote because they're actually working and can't get a. a mail-in vote well every time i've posted the voter id like the um photo id statistics who doesn't have a photo id you know i inevitably get you know white people on my wall posting me like how is this even possible like how do you even survive without a photo id and i'm like well that's because we're like i was talking about earlier when when it's you and your peers everyone has an id right how many people don't have an id and then you see the statistics and you're like whoa how can these people not have an id um, but they're in communities where their peers are more like them and our peers are more like us. And we have no clue what that's like outside the bubble. I was talking to Will Judy on the podcast a while back and he was saying, you know, we need to start by listening. Right. I mean, how in the world am I supposed to be a part of the solution if I if I totally uneducated about yeah. what their circumstances the, are like? One of the things I recommend to people is to go to forums that are specific to demographics that are marginalized in the society and obviously don't lie. You know, if it's a if it's a forum that allows, you know, for outsiders to come in and to to be there, be there. But I recommend not posting, not commenting, not saying a word. Just go in there and just read. Read and try to understand what they're saying. Hey, I appreciate the call very much. I got to move on. You take care. All right. Did I lose you? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, there's Amanda. <laughs> a little bit of a delay. Uh, vote by mail, digital voting. Tracy Harris, come on. And Trump says it's a, it's just a breeding ground for fraud, damn it. Meanwhile, we're doing most of the rest of our lives remotely, digitally, et cetera. What's your take? Yeah, I mean, the number of cases of voter fraud, of like real voter fraud, are, are ridiculously um, few. So that just, I mean, what I had somebody say the other day, they were like, oh, something about dead people voting on some voter roll. And I said, no, the dead people aren't voting. 
what there there's a difference between being on a voter roll and voting, right? So if if a location doesn't remove somebody's name because they died and they didn't get the report and it hasn't been updated on a voter roll, that doesn't mean that the person on the voter roll voted. It means that they're on the roll and they just haven't scrubbed it yet, right? So when when you hear things like this, a lot of times what people are referring to are just these they're references to things that aren't really indicative of fraud, right? This is not indicative or somebody's, oh, they're on rolls in two different states. Yeah, because they moved and they didn't report it or it hasn't been updated. But they're, it's not like they're going back and voting in both states, well, right? You know, if you're a Fox News fear pimp, <laughs> right? I mean, that's a convenient place to go because I mean, we're talking about it. Uh, this is a conspiracy theory culture. I mean, this is why we got Trump saying that it's Antifa that's driving all of the protests and he's going to good luck uh, calling them a terrorist group when Antifa is really more of an idea. It's this liquid thing out there where people just grab yeah. it and run with it. And the statistics, the law enforcement statistics, the arrest metrics don't remotely bear that, but people latch on to it like they latch on to voter fraud. You know, it's a hell of a story and it fits that conspiracy sort of mindset that many of them have. Right, but in the end what happens is you end up with the highest number of people lacking a photo ID being black, right? And so this narrative that reduces the the voting population ends up in a situation that we have a racist component to it, right? And so it ends up being part of that system of racist suppression. They're not the definitely not the only demographic being um, suppressed with a vote, but they are significantly um, suppressed by this more than any other race demographic. I've got area code 540. Hi, you're on with Tracy Harris. Who's this? Hi, this is Catherine. How are you guys doing? Hey, Catherine. Good. Catherine, talk to me. You have a uh, comment or question for Tracy? Yeah, I'm. I guess what some of my friends call the crazy evangelical because I am a Christian and my husband is not. And, um, you know, I grew up in Christianity, so I am still, you know, communicate with those people. And my parents um, have always had a hard time um, with my husband being a father because he's not making things, you know, decisions from the Christian point of view. And um, I think in general, um, the Christian demographic doesn't see um, non-Christians' concerns and so forth as valid um, because they're just... I don't want to say closed-minded, but they are. Um, one of the ladies, um, who was my mom's best friend when I was growing up, she posted on Facebook that healthcare is not a right. And just that kind of thinking, it's, my husband is a super awesome human being. He just happens to be agnostic. That's just part of who he is. That's not who he is. And it's hard for um, you know, my family and my church to see him as a human being with, you know, valid thoughts and ideas. And, you know, I have moved from, um, I didn't go to church when we first met. So I had kind of walked away from the church for a while. And then my thinking is like politically and socially not, in line with my parents and they think it's all my husband's fault because he's, you know, um, deluded my mind. And so I guess I could, there's so many things I could say. I'm talking to you guys as I'm listening to you, <laughs> but validation, I guess is just my main point is, um, the religious society doesn't see anything other than their point of view as valid. And that's got to change because we're all human. We all have basic needs. And I think Tracy, you said something about, um, Oh, smart. What was it? Um, 
I forgot. I have big brain farts. I'm, okay. I'm disabled. I'm one of the- <laughs> and we did have a discussion but, about needs not being met. I don't know if it had anything to do with that. Um, I don't remember. That's okay. okay. But um, thanks for taking my call. I'm so glad that I got on the live and that I get to listen to you guys. You rock. And um, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Oh, you're very kind. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, but Bye. she does. Uh, she brings up a good point about respecting um, agency, right? Respecting the agency of others, uh, and that's always been an interesting thing to me because um, I hear and see a lot, or did at one point, written and debated about morality. But for me, morality has been like a really simple thing, and that's kind of, I guess, a. I don't know if that makes me um, naive. But one of the things that I look at is uh, when you when you start studying um, moral tendencies in other species, morality becomes, I think, put into a more narrow focus, where you test you know two dogs to see if they understand fairness between the two of them, and one of the things you begin to notice is that they're testing two dogs and they're testing two rats and they're testing, and that this seems to be an inter intraspecies tendency that they're looking for, right? You wouldn't test a dog to see how it responds to a rabbit um, if they're treated fairly or unfairly. And part of that is because most of those dogs are going to eat that rabbit. So when you're looking, and and you wouldn't consider them to be sociopathic dogs for eating a rabbit, you would just say that's what a dog does, right? But but you would think it was sociopathic and weird if a dog ate every other dog that you put in there. You would say something's wrong with that dog. And when it comes to people, we have the same ability to recognize other human beings as being like ourselves, right? The dog recognizes other dogs in a way that it doesn't recognize other animals. It can recognize other animals, but not doesn't really interact with them the way it does forming social groups and things like it would with other dogs or wolves with wolves or, you know, animals that interact in a, in a social, on a social level. And with people, we're extremely social and we recognize each other. And what's interesting is that historically, I think this is nothing profound. Many people are aware of this, but historically you have all of these sort of golden rule statements, right? So the platinum rule do unto others as they would have you do unto them. Um, Or you have the golden rule do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Or you have other past rules like don't do things to people that you wouldn't want done to you. This idea of recognize the humanity in the other person, recognize this other person is a human being, right? Like you, recognize yourself and what what aspects of yourself are in this other person that exist in the group of humans, right? For me, when you stop doing that is when every immoral action starts to take shape you can almost always trace them back to someone who did not have the same level of respect for another as they had for themselves, right? They, they disrespected the humanity of someone else and did not really see them as, as equal to themselves. Because I wouldn't do this to you if I saw you really as, you know, would I want this done to me? No. Well, then why am I doing this to you? Or would I want someone to do this for me? Yes. Then why am I not offering to do this for you? When what she was describing, that idea of saying what we want matters and what you want doesn't matter, denies the other person their humanity because you're denying their agency. You're saying that their agency is somehow either secondary or not even relevant. And you can't really do that in a society. How much of that do you think? And I know we're not looking in her windows at the moment. I, you know, honestly, I wish I had asked. She said she was an evangelical Christian. I kind of want to know how she herself gets through the evangelical part of her Christianity to address, you know, the biblical claims about the non-believer, et cetera. But I mean, I was really at the time more interested in her family. How, you know, how much do you think their political interests in othering someone else come into play, right? Because if you're morally inferior, I, by implication, I am morally superior. It's sort of this, I call it theological masturbation, right? I mean, I am uh, kind of holier than now. This has been the calling card of the pious since time and memoriam, right? I'm reserving my human status, and I'm 
relegating yours. I'm making you less human or non-human. De- that's why they call it dehumanizing. And I feel like when you deny somebody's agency, when you literally um, deny them a voice, like uh, for their rights, for example. So if you're stripping somebody of rights, um, when, for, we just saw the, the SCOTUS ruling, I guess, to this morning is when I first saw the SCOTUS ruling for um, the equality uh for LGBTQ community, trans and gay people now, they're considering that uh, gender or, or sex discrimination, I guess, under the Civil Rights Act, they're going to include them. And the SCOTUS just said, yes, they're included. When when we're talking about sex discrimination, discrimination against gays and trans people is under that, would fall under that. And so they're protected now by existing law. Well, when I want to basically say everybody deserves to work and not be fired spuriously except for you. <laughs> I mean, what am I saying yeah, there? Yeah. These laws are supposed to protect all of all of us. They're supposed to be there to protect us as human beings and as citizens. And when I say that you are exempted from those protections, I'm literally saying that you aren't as equal. Well, and I have a vested self-interest in having more than you have, well, if I'm of that mindset. How much does the court come into play? You don't have to answer this, Tracy Harris. You don't even have to I give me the, even know the time I'm not a lawyer. How but. much does the Supreme Court come into play when you're thinking about your vote in November? I mean, are you... Oh, it's huge. <laughs> it's, it's huge. I mean, that, that court can do a lot of damage. I mean, if... We saw a 6-3 ruling, right? Two more activist judges, and holy shit, now we're, you know, we're really in hot water. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think SCOTUS is huge. And for, for people who are marginalized, who have had their rights hang by a thread until a SCOTUS ruling, you know, saved them by a razor's edge... I think all of those people are probably concerned about SCOTUS when it comes to their vote. And I understand, you know, some people it's not going to be a concern for them. Their rights don't hang by that thread, or maybe they do and they don't care. Maybe they don't you know, care about their rights, I suppose. But uh, I think for folks who do, um, who are concerned about their rights, whose rights are threatened by uh, the way this country is set up, um, the SCOTUS rulings are very important. I mean, I don't know that there's anybody that didn't know that. But well, I mean, you're, I see, a, pretty, I see some people say, statement. you know, it's not my fight. It's not why I'm. Well, for some people, it's not their fight. I mean, they're, I'm not saying that I would necessarily agree. There are times when I get involved in a thing just because I'm trying to amplify um, the voice of somebody who's not being heard and somebody who is getting their rights stripped and it doesn't affect me. Right. But uh, I certainly think that the more something affects me, the the more I'm going to care about it. And that I don't think is um, necessarily wrong. I, I think that most people, like, for example, if you're homeless, uh, I'm not going to come and bug you about why you're not doing more for trans rights, right? I mean, like a person who's that. struggling, um, the, the more you are impacted by uh, some, you know, horrible things, the more you're kind of tied up right now with your, your own stuff. Um, but if you can afford to uh, be there, for another group and you're doing okay, um, I would tend to think that we do have like a social obligation to one another in a society to sort of, like I said, make sure the product works for everyone. If it's not working for somebody and we're going to just say, we don't care if it doesn't work for people, that's, it's going to be a shitty product. It's going to be a great product for some people, but shitty for a lot of other people. And we're going to see some, some places burn. Which if brings us then to the subject of, of advocacy, right? I mean, it becomes a human rights issue for a lot of people. I, yeah. I'm not opposed to identity politics if it means we are drawing a circle around marginalized groups to define what is happening to those groups. Now, I'm all about trying to remove the dividers that splinter mm -hmm. us as part of the human condition. But I mean, I hear a lot of people bitch about identity politics. I don't know that I, I mean, in its pure form, I think it has a lot of merit and utility your take tracy harris yeah so i think that if um if you're part of a group that is being systematically targeted by a society it's really hard to be told you don't get to um like 
associate yourself with other people who are like you in regard to your target status, because they have to be able to band together and fight for their rights against what's happening to them, right? So if gay people are being murdered on the streets, they're being bashed, right? Um, I totally expect that gay people will come together and say, what the hell? Uh, We need to do something about this as gay people. And I don't have any problem with that. They have a concern there that affects them as a demographic because they're being targeted. It's like you said, I agree that ultimately it would be so nice to have a society where we didn't force people into these um, barrels, right, where they're going to be uh, oppressed and their rights will be stripped and they have to literally fight to just be considered human or considered a citizen. And... But when you're doing that to people, to then look at them and say that they're wrong for coming together to sort of defend each other against this is kind of cruel, right? I mean, it's just cruelty to to then say to them, oh, I, I resent the fact that you identify with one another uh, in a common cause of stopping me from oppressing you. I, it, it, that to me is is kind of infuriating. So if we're talking about uh, uh, these particular marginalized groups, I saw that you had posted a long article. Can men have an opinion on the abortion issue? Right. I I mean, I've got a whole chapter about abortion coming up in my book (laughs) because I want to deal with the evangelical attitudes to abortion and then how you counter those attitudes. But here I am, a dude, and I'm waxing forth about this, what I consider to be a human rights issue. The, the gist of the post is that the person that's going to pay the price is the person that has the opinion, right? So if I'm going to do something, if I'm going to strip you of your rights, um, and I'm going to do it in in a in a situation where you've committed no crime, right? You've done no, you, you you've done nothing illegal, you've done nothing to damage anybody else. You've done, and so I'm just basically saying I'm going to come along and I'm going to strip you of your rights. I'm going to come along and dehumanize you. And when, when somebody is affected by that legislation, when you're going to have a group that's affected, it's kind of like what we were talking about the stakeholders. If we're going to make the product, right? If we're going to make the product better for this demographic of people who are blind, whose opinion matters there? You know, obviously, we're going to have concerns around finances, right? Like, can, how, do we have the resources to do what needs to be done to the product? Can we do it? How do we do it? Can we do something else? Can we? But, but ultimately, the, the people who are going to be affected by the product are the ones that are going to have to tell us, you know, what it is they need there. And so, you have this community that is affected, and it's basically people who can be pregnant, right? And the people who can be pregnant and especially those who are pregnant are the ones impacted by whether or not they're going to put their lives and health at risk to gestate and birth another person. For somebody else to tell them that they have to do that or that they can't do that, really their opinion needs to be the weight, the the opinion of the person who's going to have to do the duty. Um, And the the advocate, the person that's, and and some people take issue with the word advocate, but just the person who is trying to support that, let me say. I like it. One of the things that I um, was talking about was the difference between amplifying voices and having an opinion. Okay. So when you have a community like the black community where things are going on and I stand up as a white person and I just start spouting my opinions on it and a black person stands up and says, that is not what's going on. Like, I live in this community, and this is not what's going on, you know? And what I'm saying, even if I'm trying to be somebody who's helping them, if I'm just saying what I think, and I'm not really expressing the reality of what's going on with them, what they're living day in and day out, and I'm giving an opinion on what it's like for them, and it's not right, um, that's really, really dismissive of their reality when I, as a white person, presume to, to say this is what it's like being black and this is what black people need or what they want. Um, and when I'm doing that and I'm off base, that's dismissive and I'm talking over them. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, instead of amplifying the message that they can right. speak to from a firsthand perspective. Right. And, and I've had a, I had a situation recently where I had a, um, 
the communities are going to have disagreements, right? And so that was what that post kind of dealt with was, okay, let's say that you are the guy and you recognize that, hey, this woman, it's her life and health at risk here. So she's the one that has to make this decision, not me. So if you recognize that and you're saying, so wait a minute, if I don't get an opinion, does that mean that I don't get to advocate? And it's like, well, yeah, you get to look at the situation. So you've got some women in the community who actually are anti-choice. And you have other women in the community that are actually pro-choice. The reality is that a woman who is pro-choice is not denying the woman who is anti-choice her capacity to do the things she wants to do for herself. If she wants to put her life and health at risk, the pro-choice woman is not telling her she can't, right? She's not imposing that on her. But the, the, the anti-choice side or the, what they call the pro-life side very much is stripping the ability and the autonomy and the agency of the woman who says, wait a minute, I'm not willing to put my life and health at risk for this. Well, you don't get that choice. So there's a clear divide here where you've got one side that is oppressive and one side that is not, right? One side is saying, I will allow you as a pro-life person to put your life in health. You, you can refuse medical attention and go to your death, if you want to, um, to bring this child into the world, that's your choice. Do what you will. You know, you have your freedom and I respect your agency to be able to make that decision about your own health and, and life. And so for me, the idea is when I look at a situation in, in a demographic of which I am not a part, but of which I feel some moral obligation to help, I tend to ask myself, where is the where's the damage, right? So which, which of these sides is oppressive versus not oppressive? Which of these groups is advocating for something that would do harm to another side of the group or other parts of the group? And which of these people are, are arguing for something that would actually um, liberate them in some way or make them more human, you know, grant them more human status and under our legislation. And, when, when I look at that, what I try to do to the best of my ability is to take up for the side that is advocating for greater rights and less oppression and amplify that voice. I pay attention to what they're saying and I try to understand it. And if I'm going to speak it, one thing that I learned recently because someone called me out on something and so I went back, took a step back, I thought about what I did and I thought about how I could do better. So from now on, when I go to amplify something, I'm going to make sure that I post with a voice of the community. So if I'm going to say this is upsetting to this particular group, I'm going to lead with a voice within the community saying this is the problem and this is why it's a problem and then I'm going to support that opinion. And there, there are times when I have... Um, had to make decisions about which voices to amplify where I've had like, you know, I, I follow a lot of now threads for um, black community activists and they don't always agree, right? I have some that are big Sanders supporters that loved Bernie Sanders. And I've got some that hated Bernie Sanders and some that are really pro Biden and some that, you know, think X and uh, some that are like non X, you know, it's just, but I follow them all and I try to listen. And then I try to figure out who is making the best points about what would what is the oppression and and what is a good way to handle it a good way to view it as opposed to somebody for example in a community who's not harmed by it right so for example i may not care if i have kids or don't have kids and so i'm just like well if i get pregnant of course i don't care and i'll just have the baby and it's not a problem for me financially it's fine and i don't think it's going to be a big health toll i don't have concerns there so as a woman i just don't care like go ahead and you know take the abortion rights it's not a big deal well i might not be the woman's voice you want to listen to in that regard you might want to take a look at the women who do have a problem with it and find out what that is right? Like, because I'm saying basically it's not a problem for me, but is it a problem for someone else and why? And are they making a good argument for why it's a problem? And if they are, you might not want to go with the woman who says, sure, oppress me. I don't care. I have one call left here. I've got several, but I've got one who's been on hold for the better part of an hour. Let me do my due diligence here, Tracy. 858, thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast with Tracy Harris. Who's this? 
Hi, Seth. Hey, I'm Tracy. Um, this is Bruce. Um, hey, Bruce. I'm an admirer of your show. And um, hi, um, I, I've, seen, I've heard you on, the, on, on, on Matt Dillahunty's show before. I, I really, really admire the way you think. Thank you. Um, I find I find very, very little to disagree with, with the both of you on the issue of identity politics and what you were talking about, the, the oppressed. But I, if you two don't mind, in good faith, I'd like to raise, um, I'd like to play devil's advocate here. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. The, so one of the, one of the issues I have, and, and uh, to, to, just, to, just to let everyone know, I, I'm, I'm not against the idea of white privilege. I absolutely think it exists and it's a problem. But like, my concern is when we're talking about social justice issues, I'm concerned about the level of nuance that might be swept aside by the use of that term. And I, I'm an Asian man myself. Um, and because of COVID-19, there's been an uptick in um, Asian American hate crimes. And it, it was great to see the entire community just rally around us. And, uh, you know, just if you see racism call, I mean, I was totally on board with that. But something happened that just really, really disturbed me. Um, I have family in Hong Kong at the moment, and China is just really trying to um, upturn the their legislation, just, just trying to put their influence over Hong Kong. China is now in, um, involved in, in putting Uyghur Muslims into, um, into, into concentration camps. And they, you know, they, they, they mishandled how COVID-19 is, um, they, had, they did some stuff that's making COVID-19 very difficult to handle around the world. And I was absolutely appalled when I had a friend of mine who um, was white, who threw out a social media post just calling out China. And I was appalled to see um, other people telling her, um, you know what, you're being a racist just for saying China. Um, and uh, just going so far as to say, like, you know, it going along the whole check your white privilege narrative. I'm like, guys, th- this is, this is another, this is a white individual calling out for, um, calling out for, uh, calling out, calling out a country for genuine human rights abuses that are hurting minorities in their minorities. Um, I, I, I totally hear you on the, the need to, 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 to look into, um, um, oppressive elements in our culture. But my concern is, are, are we losing the ability to hear nuance on all sides? It's like, if, if it's oh, not I know, wait, but before you, in, wait, in before area. you even go on yeah. though, um, cause I, I mean, I hear you. So this is, this reminds me very much of the, is it a valid criticism of Israeli policy or is it anti-Semitic, right? It's kind of the same thing, right? I think there's a little bit more. Yeah, I think there's a little bit more to that. And again, I, I, I am not denying um, there's such a thing as white privilege. I'm not saying that at all. No, but no, like, I, I hear what you like, um, I think, places, but I think yeah. is this is not the same. Is it not the same lack of nuance when people will say, you know, sometimes I you have to tread lightly because any criticism of Israeli political policy can be labeled as anti-Semitic. Even if you're literally just saying, no, I'm just talking about their policies, like their policy toward Palestinians or their, and, you know, I I would be calling this out, whether it was Israel or whether it was Germany or whether it was the U.S. or whatever. Um, But there are some things like that where it's very, wow, where it's very hard to distinguish um, or where people don't distinguish or unwilling to distinguish between a valid criticism and also, like you're describing, a nuanced comment um, that is not discriminatory. I have thoughts on that. Number one is I agree that there is a difference between a valid criticism and a, and a bigoted comment, right? The problem yeah. happens with context, right? For me, there's like a couple things. So, unfortunately, right now, we not only have a pandemic with which I am given to understand China made some big mistakes and maybe did some things that were super unethical. Okay. Without getting into detail, I just have read some things. Some friends of mine have, you know, made some comments, posted some things. And so I get that on the other side of it, we have a president who came out of the box just raging, trying to say that all of this shit is because of China and then the Chinese virus. And he starts throwing down this like mess of racist crap in the middle of I, I agree. all of yeah. this, right? So now you've got this hodgepodge where there are these valid criticisms about China that can be levied 
but it's now in the middle of this maelstrom of bigoted anti-Asian sentiment that is just going on and raging. I'm glad to see that it's kind of, I, I'm not going to say that, that the anti-Asian stuff has died down, but I will say that, you know, his rhetoric has calmed down. And the problem that happens, it's like a thread where somebody jumps on and they start saying something about Muslims or this criticism about Muslims. And somebody else jumps on and says, well, blah, blah, blah. And they start throwing down slurs, right? They throw a slur and you're like, whoa, whoa, that's, that's Islamophobic. That's not, that's not just a criticism. That's, you're, you're starting to get bigoted now. Then what happens is you get this thread and it's just a big hodgepodge. And some people are trying to have a conversation about criticisms of the religion. And some people are having some conversations about the culture. And some people are being just full on bigots. And some people are a mix of bigotry and criticisms. And it's just a mess. I think that it's fine to have yeah. a conversation about the real, about valid criticism. But I also think that we have to be really careful when it comes to a situation like after 9-11, bad time to start saying, let's have a conversation about the problems with Islam, right? Really bad timing. The, because yeah, I, I mean, I, you, you have all the ahead, bigotry please, that's sorry. going on, right? I mean, well, I, I feel like I'm talking a lot and I, I am, but the point is when you have a situation where people are at risk that may be the time to bite your tongue, even if you have a valid criticism. And I don't disagree with that. I think there's a lot to what you said there. And like, you know, it's but my only concern is, is like when the dust finally settles, um, are we capable of having an incredibly nuanced conversation with anything that even tangentially touches upon race or um, ethnicities? It's, it's, it's difficult to bring up because, you know, I, I've been a liberal my entire life. And it, it seems like, in, ex with rare exceptions, um, if you raise a point of contention that um, seems to go against what's um, generally considered orthodox in terms of what's righteous and what's not, the fine slices gets uh, suddenly gets uh, um, gets swept aside by the um, by the by the ire that's 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 unleashed and um it, 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 and it's difficult to have these conversations because especially since we live in a very very politicized atmosphere if you raise even minor points that make you sound right wing um your points tend to get straw man and like um you, you tend to get into a conversation where like no one hears um the specifics in what you're saying um and no i mean you're right and, like, again, you're not yes, you're not right. wrong but the problem is it's the mess, right? Because you, how many, and you, you sound like somebody that's pretty level-headed. How many times have you been on a thread like that where you see somebody who is throwing out something that you're just like, whoa, that's pretty bigoted. And their lead in is, you know, I'm not trying to be a bigot here, but there is this issue of blah, blah, blah. And you read it and you're just like, oh man, no, dude, that's, that's way out of line. And they believe that they're having a discussion that is really open-minded and informed and it's not at all. Do you know what I'm saying? Like they'll have that same attitude yeah. of like, Oh, there's this nuance and they start to say something and you're just like, no, that's just more racist garbage. Um, that's different than what you're trying to describe. But what I'm saying is it doesn't help the conversation when everybody feels like they're not being the bigot. It's almost like nobody's the villain in their own story Right. And so if everybody's the good guy in their own story, then the good guy is getting frustrated because he's looking at villains saying they're the good guy, too. Right. Or I post something and I'm critical of Islam and then a bunch of Islamist phobes come on and start taking over the thread. And then I'm just like, I'm sorry, I even posted this thing, even though I, you know, I support what I posted. But now look what I've unleashed. Right. Um, and so, it, yeah, yeah, it, it depends. A lot depends on you know con the context of it. And the sad fact about this is, if Trump hadn't unleashed all the racist garbage, we probably could have had a discussion about China. If you didn't have somebody up there screaming Chinese I, I don't virus, yeah. don't you think? No, I, yeah, I don't, I don't disagree at all. Um, but and um, you know, again, I, I pretty much agree with everything with everything you just said. It's just my just my genuine concern is that 
will we still be capable of having these fine these fine slice discussions in the future? Now, let me just we'll find out. Like, Forgive we're, me just we're, a second. I, I, I love, I'm fascinated by yeah. both of you. But isn't part of the problem this weird assumption, especially online, not as much in person, but online, there seems to be this immediate jump to bad agency. Like whoever said it, well, they're operating in bad faith and they're saying it because they're an asshole and now it becomes war, right? Doesn't the um, atmosphere change if we start by saying, well, wait a minute, they may not realize or understand, or maybe they're actually operating in good faith and we disagree on point of fact or philosophy. This is something that now can be discussed because they aren't an asshole. And yet online, I mean, that really, the internet lends itself more to trying to win than trying to discuss. Am I wrong? No. Well, I don't know. We've got a caller on the line. Have you had these conversations with people in person and do you have the same experience? Yes, I, I, I have had some conversations with people on, you know, on my own side. Um, you know, I, I, I'm actually friends with people who are, who are, I have a fair amount of people who are in my life who are conservatives or Republicans. And I, would challenge any of my liberal friends to call them racist. I mean, they're, they're not, but they're, they're, you know, I, I don't necessarily agree with their points and um, we, we talk, but um, some of the more disheartening conversations I've been, uh, I've been in were with other, with my fellow liberals. And um, I, I, you know, I try to talk to them you know, with um, some nuance and I, I've literally been shot down by people on my own side saying like, why are you, you you should defriend everyone who who voted for trump you should um you should just dismiss um uh, these 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 republic these republicans and just go get yourself a bunch of new friends i'm like how the hell does that help the conversation in any way you're you're just helping with the polarization i mean it's i understand when when on the internet where um someone is talking to someone else and you know because of the way they said something um you sound like an asshole and and i sympathize with that but in 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 an era in which we're we're talking about the need for more dialogue, I mean, how are we supposed to have it in a um, in, uh, in in this highly charged arena? I, like, and that's 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 the crux of my concerns. And you know, I and, and I'm a liberal. You know, I I definitely believe in just about everything that you, you and Seth are just talking about. Don't don't get me wrong, but my concern is like, how are we going to have this kind of dialogue that's necessary that 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 will get the justice that we want? Um, if we're not willing to hear each other out, if we're going to just demonize each other. And that's, that's a problem as I see it. So your question for Tracy is how do we fix the world? Okay. Well, that's good. That's good. Let's do it. No, I, 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 I think I, I actually yeah. do. I do try to, what I try to do on my page is to sort of, I do a deep dive into certain demographic forums like i said I'll, I'll hang out and i will just listen and see what happens and whenever i see something that surprises me or i think whoa you know i didn't realize that i'll go ahead and write up a little post about it and what i'm doing is saying look this is this is the thing that triggered me to write this post and this is what surprised me about it as a white person or as a woman or you know whatever this is what i hadn't thought of um, as a straight person um as a cis person whatever and I float those little things on my page. And I'm very happy to hear Seth say that he <laughs> sees these things and they make him think. And they make him say, you know, I didn't think of it that way. Um, to some degree, I'm hoping that I'm contributing to expanding that dialogue by giving these ideas to people within my community, which is in many ways a dominant community, um, to kind of say, have you thought of this? Did you know this? Were you aware of the statistic? What does this mean to you? Do you see what the problem is here? Um, you know, and so by, I think, giving these little tidbits out there. Now, sometimes I get like some really heavy backlash on something. But a lot of times I just get a little bit of debate that gets spawned, an argument that gets spawned. And there is a conversation that occurs. And it's sort of, for me, a way to kind of ease people into these waters, right, to say, Here's this little thing. Here's this little thing. Uh, most of it's not huge, but there are times when it does get big and it does get heated and where there is something going on where I admit I will, I will start, you know, the block, 
the block machine and just start saying, nope, can't have that. I mean, I, I'm i okay with somebody trying to make some points or somebody that struggles with a point, but when someone comes and just sort of lays the hammer down and starts um, talking over somebody that's marginalized or dismissing them or trying to silence them or, you know, um, in, in some way demean or invalidate them, they'll get maybe a warning that they need to back off depending on how egregious it is. And then if it continues, it's just, it's going to be gone because I'm not going to, I'm not going to allow marginalized people on my page to be abused just so we can have a conversation. But I, I am okay with people kind of talking about a point of interest that not everybody may have thought about or been aware of. I don't know if that's what you would consider helping, um, but I am trying to get people to think a little bit more. I see. Um, yeah, again, very little for me to disagree with, but uh, I, there's so many different angles here that I definitely want to play devil's advocate on. But the, the, um, however, I, I've taken up enough of your, of your time already, but I really appreciate the conversation and the perspective you guys offered me today. You're very um, kind. Thank you for your call. Thank you. you know, thank you both. See you. Hey, I see it as I'm in a position where I – feel an obligation to make a comment about something that speaks to my values in the hopes that it will be a part of the conversation and maybe encourage and empower others who see it and go, yeah, okay, finally, I'm not alone. I mean, there's a number of reasons. And somebody comes in and they're belligerent and awful and they're just an agent of chaos. And I don't use the block button a lot, but I have found myself using it more because you don't get to come into my living room, right? I mean, it, and abuse people. And of course, then they'll find another way to reach out. But my free speech, right? You yeah. want an echo chamber. You don't ever want to be disagreed with. And it's really not about that, is it? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I found No, I mean, it, that's how, exactly how I see it. If I had a house party where a bunch of people were and there was a disagreement going on, I would allow the disagreement to go on. And I might even allow people to, you know, hurl swear words at each other and be like okay <laughs> but if um, but if somebody really starts like saying things that literally dehumanize somebody and invalidate that human being um that's the kind of thing where they're going to get a like i say a warning and an explanation about hey that's not acceptable um, because what you're doing now is further marginalizing a marginalized person, right? And that, to me, is the, is the problem. There is some speech that marginalizes. And that speech contributes to marginalization, right? This is how you identify the, the target. You identify your target with a slur or with some dog whistle that lets you know that this person is your target. Now, you can target me for things that aren't going to marginalize me, right? You could say, if somebody wanted to say, oh, you're a liberal, well, that doesn't margin, liberals, liberals aren't marginalized, right? It's like, okay, fine, you've, you've identified me as like some other, but it's not some other where you're actually damaging me. But if you start to identify me as some hysterical female, now you're using marginalizing language, right? You're using language that basically says these are those people that are like this and they just can't reason and they can't. You're throwing down this thing that, that basically is intended to diminish me as a woman, human, right? You're saying that I am, this is this thing where you can just dismiss me because of my gender um, and not, and it's not, um, and and as as a group that does have problems with particular social metrics, right? Like I am in a demographic, even though I do well um, as a woman, I know that statistically there are areas where women do not do well. And for that, um, to go ahead and start using those types of, the types of language, like either slurs, gender slurs, or dog whistles that, let people know you can just diminish and dismiss this person because they're a woman. And that's, you know, a group that has been traditionally and historically dismissed that didn't have a vote that couldn't hold office that really, you know, couldn't at some times have, you know, access to their own funding, their own money, um, take out a loan from a bank. It's, you know, so 
there are certain, when you have a group that comes from a traditionally marginalized segment that is still marginalized today, either greatly or, you know, still in some regards, I look at that as when you start to use language that identifies them as that target, you're contributing to all that whole system that is the problem that is dehumanizing them in a way that's immoral and that in also in a way that strips them of quantifiable rights and opportunities. That's a, an encouragement I'd like to give to other people. You get to determine how much awfulness happens on your page. And if somebody's genuinely there to be abusive, you're like, don't let yeah. the door hit you where evolution yeah. splits you. All right. Well, just. But I do, I do though want to stress that point that, that the, you know, abuse and the, there is abuse in the form of just being mean to people or being offensive to people. And then there is abuse in the form of actually doing harm by further marginalizing marginalized groups, which is a whole different thing, right? Offending me doesn't have quantifiable damage with it, but marginalizing people does, right? When you marginalize them, we can start looking at the statistics about what happens to this group as a marginalized group and how they're suffering from social, you know, negative social metrics, and when you're using targeting language toward a group that's marginalized, you're contributing to that. That's part of the systemic problem. Now, how much of that is subjective? I mean, some of it's pretty easy. But I mean, then are we subject to the biases of the recipients and where their lines are subjectively drawn? I mean, that gets a little sticky. How do you make those determinations? While I think that you could get into a gray area, there was, that's a really good example of something that just happened to me recently. So, um, something had occurred in the media, and I saw an interview where a black guy had said, this is um, not something I felt like a white person should say. And when I went on Twitter, I started to look at to see what, you know, what are, what's on the feeds, what, are, what is the community saying about it? Well, some folks in the community were saying, this is perfectly okay, and white people just need to stay out of this. And there were other people who were saying, I find this just like infuriatingly angering, right, to me as a black person. And there were other people who were like, you know what, I'm willing to let it slide, but yeah, it annoyed me. So here's what I would say. If I'm a white person, and I'm going to say a thing, and that thing is going to be taken by some of the marginalized group as completely infuriatingly out of line and by others in that group as annoyingly out of line, but they're not going to call me out on it, but yes, they're going to see me as a racist. And some of that group is going to say, yeah, whatever, I don't care. I don't see the problem. Do I want to say the thing that is going to make members of that group feel more marginalized? Like how, how, how much is it, how important is it to me to say it that way or to make that specific comment? Can I not say what I want to say in a way that doesn't result in that? Can I not rephrase the thing I'm going to say? Do I have to say that thing that way? Or can I be more sensitive, right? And so when I look at that, there's a, there's a question of cultural sensitivity and context, right? So for example, if I'm in a, all white group and I make an offhand comment, or let's not even say me, let's just say, you know, person X likes to tell jokes about lynching. The jokes are always about white people. The jokes are always told in the proximity of white people. Is anybody in that crowd going to feel personally threatened by any of that? No. Would it be okay for him to say, since nobody ever gets upset about it, I guess it's okay to say this in a group of black people. Or would that be a different context? Oh, it's just not a rhetorical question? Yeah, it would be. A, it would, yeah, it's not okay. Absolutely. Right. Now, so there can be a thing <laughs> that I can say that is okay to say, but then when I say it in a particular context, now it's not okay to say it anymore. And part of that has to do with the historic implications of what these things mean to particular demographics versus what they mean to a demographic that never had that threat hung over their head, right? So we have a situation where lots of people were lynched in the past, but in general, white people were lynched for things that they were accused of as opposed to just, you know, being white. And 
it, this is a specific form of violence that we have come to associate with a specific demographic as a specific threat. So we don't say that. Now, is it possible that there's going to be people in that demographic who say, I really don't care? Well, sure. Just like there's women who say, I don't care if you take my abortion rights away. I don't care if you, you know, take my reproductive rights away. You're going to have that. But the question should be, do I have, do I have any responsibility when I'm going to acknowledge that I live in a, in a society that is a product that doesn't work for this group? to understand what it is that bothers that group or what it is that is creating a problem for that group or what makes them feel even less inclined to use the product or to be able to or feel like they can use the product or they just feel if I'm going to make them feel dismissed and unheard and dehumanized by something that I'm saying, then maybe I either need to not say it or maybe I need to find a better way to say it. Maybe it's just the way I'm saying it or the context in which I'm saying it. But I do think that on the one hand, yeah, you're probably always going to have, you know, missteps or things where you're going to have a debate about whether or not this is a problem. Within the community, you're going to have debates about whether or not it's a problem. My question is, how racist do I want to seem? How racist do I want to sound? How racist do I want to be? And that's going to matter. That's why it matters to me to get myself informed about how this community is looking at things, how they respond to things, how they react to things, how they feel about the way people express things. And I feel like I have an obligation to try and educate myself. Maybe um, it's a big ask, right? Because there's so many things you could be ignorant about that I could be ignorant about. But sort of like literature, right? There's a huge works of English lit. But when Harry Potter came out, I am not a big fan of kids lit, not at all. It's like one of my least favorite forms of literature, but it was so huge and such a giant social thing, phenomenon, that I went and got those books and plowed through the entire series so that I would know what the hell was happening because there's the, I saw the movies, I went, read the books, um, it was a chore. But I wanted to be socially literate in a huge phenomenon that was going on at the time. References were being made still to this day, like, you know, shows, everything. It's huge. So I may miss the boat on some things. There are definitely marginalized communities of which I could be better informed. And I will totally admit that, right? And, and I do still think it's my obligation to try not to go too deep into conversations about things of which I have not taken steps to inform myself. And I do make that mistake. Um, and I always regret it. <laughs> but when it comes to a community where you've got something like Black Lives Matter that has just been marching since 2016 in a huge way, and the civil rights movement that has been going on since before I was born, I really think that we should be at a point where I should feel compelled enough and obligated enough to make myself informed so that I am not saying culturally insensitive things. I think cultural insensitivity at this point with this much on the line becomes almost unforgivable as far as, and I don't mean unforgivable in the sense of it should ruin your life. I mean, unforgivable in the sense of you have no excuse at this point for saying a thing that is, you know, that out of line. And so if you do, which I do and I will, I need to acknowledge it, own it, apologize for it, and do better going forward. Tracy Harris, what you just said will not fit on a t-shirt. I can't get that all on a t-shirt. I mean, I'd like to, but I just, it's not practical for me. But do you understand what I'm saying? Like, I get your, I get what you're saying about, you know, I don't think you can always avoid a misstep. And I can't, and I think sometimes you might get called out on something. Like I saw a couple people that got upset that one of the legislators brought in a Kentucky fried chicken dinner to call out another um, Senator on being chicken. Nobody involved was black. But there were a couple of people in the black community. I watched them talk about it. They said it was racist. They didn't really explain why. But my thought was, instead of saying, that's not racist, in the future, get yourself like some chicken fettuccine and bring that in to show him. You know what I, I mean? Because everybody likes chicken I fettuccine. I mean, I, mean I, I'm, I think if you, people perceive you're acting in good faith, great. There is a demographic of people that it is in their interest to vilify so that they might play the hero. And I just don't think there's any pleasing them. I think you have to be true to yourself and your values and your standards and do the best you can. And those who are interested in seeing through it will and see your intention. 
Tell me you're on uh, the the air somewhere talking about stuff <laughs> somewhere. Tracy Harris. People Nothing are in the like chat that. room and they're like, "Is she? <laughs> does she have a? She needs a show. Does she have a show? Okay. Do you have a show, Tracy Harris?" So yeah, I mean, I I kind of stepped back, I guess, from stuff, and I did get a lot of people who were like, "Well, what are you doing now? What are you doing?" And so I started a blog. It's just for fun, right? The blog is just for fun. It's sort of like journaling to the world, and so What's it I. Do not, it's called at home in my head and I can give a real quick, so there's like a lot, I'm sure people, if they listen to the, there's a podcast that's like a, that mirrors some of the content, right? So the, the blog itself is just miscellaneous content, just any, it's my head, right? Stuff that I did, cooking, house, house renovation, um, anti-racism resource, like anything I come across that I feel like, hey, here's something worth sharing or here's something I think might somebody might find interesting. I'll just put it out there. Um, I don't think necessarily people are interested in my personal life all that much. It's not my goal to like get a giant following. I just am putting it out there and anybody that is interested in it or enjoys it is welcome to be there. Um, and if not, not. And the there are some pieces of it though uh, so indoctrination, I did a talk on indoctrination and I wanted to not lose that material because it was a super, super long research process for me. And I vetted it through two psychiatrists and I, you know, so I, I worked with some people in the field in order to, um, come to what I came to and I didn't want to just throw it away, uh, when I kind of pulled back from activism. So I posted it as a series at the blog. That was one of the first things I posted. And then I decided I wanted to make that information more accessible to people. So I went ahead and got it up on YouTube. I got it up onto a podcast, mainly just to get that indoctrination information out. But the blog, I kind of kept going and just journaling, journaling about my life. And then I ended up um, starting another series that was part of the blog that's also going up on the podcast and also going on YouTube, which is about um, perspectives on death. And that was spawned by a podcast that I was involved in that was a memorial to somebody who was still alive but dying. And it was a very interesting conversation. Uh, and it made me start thinking about, you know, different perspectives on death that can exist within the same person, right? We have a, I guess, a concept of how does your perspective on death change when you become an atheist? And what I started thinking when I started to think about my own thoughts about death was there really isn't a perspective on death. And I think that every person is capable of many perspectives on death. It just depends on the context of the death. You know, who was the person who died? What was my relationship to them? Um, what was the circumstance of the death? What was it? Like all those things can play a part in how you are affected by a death or how you process that event. Um, that I just started to think, I don't know that it even matters if you're theist or atheist because there's so much more to somebody died than God or not God, right? Or afterlife or not afterlife. It's like it affects you in different ways no matter where you're at um, on the God spectrum. So I started to do that one and that's when I'm putting up. So basically, I guess the, the short version that I should have maybe started with is that the blog is a huge bunch of of miscellaneous pot potpourri and the podcast and the YouTube channel just mirror them. They mirror each other and they only mirror certain types of content from the blog. So you'll get more if you go to the blog, if you want all the, the whole, all, everything. But if you just want to see the, the highlights that I thought were worth sharing out on the podcast or on the YouTube channel, then go to the podcast and the YouTube channel and you'll filter out a lot of stuff you're not interested in. Um, and with that, I will also say that they're tiny, tiny things. Like I've, I've done these Coursera courses, which I love. And those little courses tend to be only like five, 10 minutes long. And I love them. And so I decided to do the podcast um, with little things. So I think the longest running uh, episode is only 23 minutes. And the rest of them are all like right around, you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes long. So they're real quick, quick clips. Meanwhile, I'd allotted about an hour for you, and we are well over the two-hour <laughs> mark. My apologies for... <laughs> My apologies. For, I talk too much. No, so you get two hosts <laughs> in the room, and you just go, and one thing leads to another. It's so good to be able to hang and talk. I'll put all the links. I got your Twitter link. I'll put the podcast link. Certainly, the link to donate to Truth and Transparency as they are facing a Thank potential you. legal battle we want to get behind 
this uh, effort to try to expose what they're about and, you know, to try to give that information to the public. And I think more than that, for me, it's I just don't want to see the church or these religious institutions try to intimidate their critics out of criticizing, you know. Or- um, if I could just plug as well, I know that people have a lot going on right now and it's not um, not everybody can donate. And I understand that. It would be a huge help even if you could just share out the link. So if you're listening and you're just like, hey, man, I wish I had the money, but I don't. I have all these other things going on. I have lost my job because of COVID. I mean, I am not going to ask you to donate if, if you're struggling or, or you know you know, know other people that are that you're trying to help. But if you could just share the link, there might be somebody out there that could donate and getting the word out is huge. So thank you. Good stuff. Tracy Harris, always a pleasure. Let's talk again soon, okay? Thank you so much. It was great, great getting to like, connect with you again. You bet.